let me jump into my our message this morning. But let me first off say thank you for all of you that were here last week uh, in the service and your willingness to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, whether you're online um, or watching or here in person. Uh, I heard from many of you what you had felt, what you have heard, and how the service impacted you. And we know that it's, it is not the service, but it was who was in the service. There was a real tangible presence of the Lord that was in our midst. And as your pastor, I pray for God to show up. I, even last Sunday morning, I got up earlier than normal and just felt like I was supposed to come over and pray last Sunday morning right before. Like it was, not that I don't pray, but it was in that, it was something special that just felt like the Lord woke me up uh, about an hour early and I was here just to pray before service. And just sensing that the Lord was doing something, going to be doing something different. And I pray that his presence would be real and that he would lead and guide our services each week. Each week, just want to, just kind of open back here, open up a little bit for you as your pastor. We come in with a plan, and let me tell you, it's a loose plan of where we're headed. In many weeks, we walk through the norms of what a, a church service would have and the schedule, but we always want to be open to waiting on the Lord for when he is in the room. And uh, I'm thankful. Uh, uh, Grant, uh, thank you. I mean, even last week he was an hour and a half playing with the, playing guitar and his fingers calloused and all those things. And But our team and them, but, you know, really for, you know, for us, for me as a pastor, really to have a, a grant and not only as a staff member, but a friend to be able to have conversations and walk through and say, let's, we're going to lead, follow the leading of the Lord and to be able to trust, uh, to, that I can trust him in the leading of that. And just as encouraging to me as your pastor, but it's not something that when the moving of the Lord happens, it's not spooky, it's not freaky or weird, but it's something many times that our human minds are not able to fully grab a hold of. The best that I can describe it is that there is an awareness uh, of what seems to be kind of like a thickness in the room. There's no fog, but you can sense that something and rather someone is here. I strive for our church to be a church that is in and knows the word of God. That's why we're challenging you to read the word. Um, and I know that as we raise the awareness and understanding of the word, that we also see the moving of his spirit to continue to be stronger in our gatherings. We are a Pentecostal church. We do want to see the move of the spirit take place, but it cannot override the word of God. And when the word of God increases, the, whole, the moving of the Holy Spirit will increase as well. And we know that any time a word is given in the service, according to 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, that it has to line up with the word of God. And it also needs to bring peace to our hearts. Well, last week in the service, I did not preach a full message. I delivered a word of God from Romans that was on my heart to talk about the kindness of God in Galatians 5 and the fruit of the spirit. Within that, there were also a welcoming of each of you to share what God was speaking to you in the moment of silence that we had and you were able to just listen. He spoke through so many and clarified his word and his presence with us. I'm, I'm thankful that we just take time and take the microphone and just be able to walk around this room and hear what God was speaking to us. That it's not just somebody delivering from this way, but also God speaking and using because he uses the whole body. I don't wanna be a church that's just one-sided presentation of speech from the pulpit but for us to engage and interact with one another and with the Holy Spirit. Rest assured that sometimes it will be messy. And I will admit that there are times as your pastor, I will miss the mark at times, but the grace to be able to walk and wander with the Lord is what we ask, what I ask for. And for those of you that missed the service last week, know that we pray that the Lord continues to minister to you wherever you are. And two, I want to encourage you, to set your alarm to be here. I mean, I know I'm preaching to the choir, right? And to invest in others and allow yourself to be invested by others into you. That when this body comes together, it's a necessity that 
The body with all its parts are used and together. We need each other in the body of Christ. We need unity. And I expect God to move when we gather. I come with a heart of expectation. Now, let me clarify that I don't expect him to move like he did last week every time. But I will be open to his moving and encourage you to come with a heart of expectation too. Let's believe and trust God to move in our lives while here in the church, but also outside of these four walls. Finally, I I already said it. I want to encourage you to know that we have a great team on our leadership team from our staff, our board, and our spouses. We are praying and believing God that he is going to move here at Kettering. We communicate during the services and even evaluate afterwards. I trust the leaders that are around me to help lead our church, and they're very important to me. This is not the Pastor Josh Plassant's show. I want you to realize I am a man with authority, but I'm also a man under authority. And I ask if you ever have questions or want to understand more of what God is speaking, how things operate or happen, please let me know, and I'd love to sit down and chat with you. I may not have all the answers, but I invite you to be part of the journey with us. Amen? Well, last week, let me, I I had to kind of do my pastoral conversation. Let me jump into my message fully. Last week, we talked about the Lord and uh, the expression of the Lord and the kindness of God. How kind was he to speak to us and to be present in the moments with us in that service? There are people in churches that will gather across the world that won't stop for a moment just to allow God for us to hear God. So many times it's like we go to the, it would be like going to the doctor where you walk into the doctor's office and you give your litany of all, and your list of all your problems, ailments, and whatever else. We do that in the church. It's called our prayer request, right? And then the doctor says, well, give me a moment. I'll be right back. And, and, and he goes out to maybe put the thoughts together or be like, or talk to anybody else in the audience and say, what's up with them, right? You know, some of that. <laughs> But in the church, so many times we give our litany and our requests, and all we do is when the doctor steps out or when in those pause moments, we just leave and just say, well, I've done everything I need to, and I've dropped everything at his feet. We don't wait for, like, if you're going to go to the doctor for a need, you wait for the doctor to come back in and give a diagnosis or whatever, right? I just want to encourage you, like, the kindness of God that he would come and speak to us in that moment. And then not only as we lay things before him, but that he comes back and he ministers and speaks to our hearts. I believe that God is continually showing his kindness to us, but that we are not always listening or positioned in such a way to see what he is doing. Over the last five weeks, we've been walking through Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. It's a portion of the scripture known as the fruit of the spirit. The fruits of the Spirit. Paul was writing to the Galatians of the importance of life, of of their life, of living a life marked by the Spirit of God and not a life that was ruled by the flesh. In verses 19 through 20 of Galatians, we see that uh, it says, now the the deeds of the flesh are evident. This is Paul speaking to the, about the evidence of the flesh. That they're evidence. They are immorality, impurity, sensuality, uh, sensuality, uh, indo- idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and other things like that, of which I have forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're talking about the uh, a character. Uh, evaluation here where this series is called character for me it's just called character 101 that we we need while we need God to move we also need to respond by adjusting our character and when we look at what is the standard how do we how do we succumb to this how do we plan <clears throat> on January 1st many of you will go into 2023 isn't it hard to believe I think we're 54 days away from fall right now okay it's weird. I mean, in how many weeks are we going to have Christmas? Oh my gosh, right? Don't even. Is it 45 days? 149 days. Thank you, Jenny, till Christmas. Get your shopping started. <coughs> order now, you know, stuff may be on COVID back order, right? You know, whatever. 
But the, we, we're going to plan January 1st to have this, this like we're going to remake ourselves in 2023, right? And, and what's the stand? I mean, how many, most of the things, the statistics are crazy of how little those things last for the long term. I want to ask you, like, what is, what's the standard by which we set the changes that need to happen in our lives? The Word of God lays out these things and says, listen, if you're going to live by this code, by this code in what I just read of 19 through 21, it gives a serious warning of verse 21 that says that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I want to ask you, like, if this is... If this defines your life, if those characteristics in 19 through 21, if that's part of your character of who you are, there's a reward that you will receive for the decisions that you make. Rewards have both positive and negative to them. You are, you are paid when you go to work and do your job, you are paid for your job. When you live your life and how you choose to live your life with character, you will be rewarded when you stand before God one day on the life that you chose to live. But pastor, these things are and my friends and they're all these different things and this is appealing to me and this is all these things. And, and I was thinking like, but the reward and the reward is already defined. <clears throat> so when you stand before God, it will not be a surprise. And it should not be a surprise because the scripture speaks of it. So Paul is telling him, telling the church in Galatia, saying, hey, listen, not only are, you know, like this is the lifestyle. This is, if you do this, this is the response. But he's saying, but, but God is so good that he doesn't just leave it there. Let me my water to me. It's on the front there. But it's just, he doesn't stop there. He says, but in verse, uh, in, in verse number 22, thank you. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And against such things, there is no law. God is so good that, that he just doesn't say, if you're going to do this, but he gives us a way and says, listen, if we live our lives, the basis of this, number one, of the fruit of the spirit is that you've got to live your life for Jesus. There's, you can be a good person and still go to hell. Andy Stanley wrote a book called How Good is Good Enough. It's one of those little bathroom books, you know, you put it on the back of a toilet and you're right there and if somebody comes, but how good is good enough? There are going to be good people that will stand before God one day and says, well, I'm a good person. But what's the level of good? Your standard of good is different than my standard of good. When we go out to, to dinner to, uh, uh, when well, we go to this Indian restaurant up here around the corner, Kelly always orders a level five hot. Right? Come on. She is always like a level five hot, like, whoo, burn your tongue off. My wife's like, give me zero, okay? I'm like, e -e -e, give me a three. I'll try a middle, two or three, whatever. Amy's like a one. Yeah, Amy's a one. So when it was, it's a favorite of the restaurant. Doug does not like it, so don't ever take Doug there. But, but the rest of us, we, we go. And, and, but see, like our level of hot is different. And just like the level of good is different. So how good is good enough? The only way that you can settle the good of good enough is with a life that's completely surrendered to Christ. The basis of the church, the basis of our message, the basis of who we are as Kettering Assemblies of God has to be the gospel message, which the full gospel says that Jesus, he came to this earth as a baby. He rose, uh, that he, he lived a sinless life. He died on a cross, but yet he didn't die and stay there. He came back to life and he's coming back for the rest of us. And the hope that we have in the gospel and that we, we build character, that we build the, the fruits of the spirit in our life, not as works, but as opportunities and character development to be more like Christ. 
in my office today. You can go in there and look at my shelves. I, you know, I've got my leadership degree, or well, someday I'll have the certificate on my wall when it gets mailed to me, right? And but I've got all these books on my shelf that talks about how to be a better leader and how to do all these things. But at some point it comes down to that to be a good leader means that I have to have a life that's surrendered to Christ. That it's not about, but as a leader, it's not about you serving me, but it's about me serving you. And in the midst of that, as I lean into Christ, as you lean into Christ, suddenly the fruits of the Spirit begin to line up in our lives and we can be intentional. And so today we're talking about the character trait of goodness. One walks in goodness when they are full of all good and they do all good. There is a heart. Uh, goodness is about the attitude of the heart and the behavior. It's about being good and doing good. Goodness represents a person of quality. You know, somebody like, they've got good quality to them. One who walks in goodness is concerned not only about themselves, but not about also about protecting others from the evils of this world. You want to just, let's just step back. How do you live out the, the principle of goodness and the fruit of the spirit? Do you stand up for others in the evils of this world? And sometimes, the, and let me just say, like, how do you stand up for others in the evils of this world is that you say, uh, listen, no matter what they say, I'm going to be, I'm not going to be obnoxious, but I'm going to tell them about Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and give them the opportunity to respond to God. You want to deal with the evils of this world, don't keep what God's done in your life to yourself, but open it up and say, God, this is what God's done in me. I may not be perfect, but I want to tell you that if you want to overcome the things of this world, that you need to surrender your life to Christ. But we're worried about what are they going to say, or we're going to worry so many times about how are they going to answer, or are we going to know the questions, the answers to the questions that they have for us. And I'll tell you, there are times where I don't know all the answers. Sister Pastori calls me and she'll ask me a question and I'm like, I, I don't know that answer. I'm so sorry. So I'm Google, I go to my Logos software, I do research and I try to, you know, there's times that I don't know those answers. Now, I know that some of you, I'm like, that's, you know, pastor, you're supposed to know those things. Ah, <sighs> yes. I'm not a, I'm not a teacher by nature. Um, but I'll dig in and, and look and research and find out. And even from my seat, if I am afraid to even allow the question to come, then, then who am I trusting in? I mean, I've sat at tables and people have asked me a question and I'm just, and on my breath, I'm praying in the spirit and say, oh God, I have no clue what I'm about to say. But that the Lord will bring in an instant a scripture to me. Or he'll, he'll speak in an instance to us because my reliance isn't upon ourselves, on me. It needs to be upon the Lord. When I talked about goodness in, in study, you, as I've done with this whole series to start with, is we really talk about who God is first. Psalm 34, 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Men good being pleasant and agreeable generous, pleasing. When we look at the doctrine of God or who he is, we see the attributes that he embodies. If you were to look at the, the doctrine of God and all the attributes, there's goodness and love, mercy, grace, holiness, righteousness, truthfulness, wisdom, and wrath. That he, that's who God is. These, all these things all wrapped up in one person. A thing is good when it is all that it should and can be. When it's perfect. And, and who, do, doesn't that describe who God is? That he is perfect? That he is all that he should and can be? Maybe today as I talked, as I just gave out the attributes of God, maybe you just focused on the wrath of God because that's what the world focuses on. It's just the, the negative component. And even in our lives, we don't look at the good things about what is God is doing in our life. We look at the deficits and the deficiencies that we have instead of saying, wow, look what God's doing over here in my life. 
But while God has wrath, he also has goodness and love and mercy and grace and holiness and righteousness and truthfulness and wisdom. And wrath is there too. But it all, it all encompasses who God is. And because he is God, he is indefinite. Doesn't that make his goodness unmeasurable in the amount and depth of it? You're like, I'm, I'm going to get, man, God's so good. <coughs> I, I was, um, was it Jeremiah Johnson was uh, just posted something yesterday on his Facebook page. And Jeremiah, a, a prophet, and um, he actually wrote a book and back before the election saying, you know, uh, Donald Trump would win the election and all those things. And whatever you feel on that doesn't make a difference. But uh, there was 56 prophets that came out at that point in time before the election saying Donald Trump would be the next president. And uh, to my knowledge, uh, this was a conversation we had in our class one day for school. In my knowledge, uh, Jeremiah Johnson was the only one of those prophets that came forward and humbled himself and totally shifted the focus of his ministry and said, I was wrong, humbled himself before pastors and leaders and said, listen, my heart, I need to make sure my heart is right, stepped away from ministry for a little part of a season to come back in and say, listen, God's really called me about the bridegroom and about being part of this role. And so for those of you who know his story or whatever, don't discredit those parts, but you see what God's done in his heart since. And he shared a vision uh, yesterday uh, that the Lord had given him, and it was this picture of, of, of a line of people on a, a cliff, and there was a bunch of fire below, and was hell, and there was just this line of people following a pastor and following these things, and they just would, would go over the edge of the cliff, and it was just about the fact that, that um, he was saying there are good people. There are people that go to church. There are people that know the word of God, but they don't know the writer of the word. They don't know the author of the word. They don't know all of who God truly is. And there are good people that will will just walk off the cliff and follow whatever. And and that's why it's important as a church, as as, as people of God, that we understand the fullness of the word of God. That it's not we're going to scratch out this part and make it applicable to us. And 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 that doesn't mean anything to us. But we're going to but we use the wholeness of who God is, the wholeness of His word. Wholeness of where he is at, because he showed that he's had this picture, said there is a time coming when many will just walk off the edge. Friends, it's the importance that we understand the goodness of who God is. And we look at the depth of what he's done in our life. And, and, and another portion of that, those people that were in the line that the Lord spoke to him about in that, his vision, said those were people that were healed. And those people, those were people that had been praying about jobs and God provided jobs. And those were parents that had been praying about their prodigal child that had come, that was away from God and they'd come back from him, back to the Lord. And, and they had celebrated in those moments what God had done, but they have lost the vision of what God had done. All, I mean, have we gotten to a place in our life where, where God has to keep providing the, you know, the sugar and the candy every time we walk in the room? Or are we just satisfied with the goodness of God? At some point, we, we, he, he is new, his power, his presence is new every morning. But that doesn't negate the role in what he's done in the past in our lives. That we celebrate where we've come, but we don't forget where we've come because that's the goodness of who our God is. That it's a reminder that today maybe some of you would not be in this room or watching because of the fact that if you hadn't given your, if God's goodness didn't rescue you back here, you would never have made it this far in your life. But we forget and we're always looking, we're waiting for our sugar daddy to give us the next thing. God, I need your hand, I need your hand, I need your hand out, I need your hand out. When some of us, we just need to be satisfied at times just saying I'm in his presence. I'm where he wants me to be. And it doesn't mean that I always have to have my thing, but, but when, he, when he doesn't move in my life, but he moves in somebody else's life, do I celebrate with them? Or is it all about what I get out of my relationship with Jesus? Taste and see that the Lord is good. Where does God get his goodness from? 
He doesn't need it from anybody else but himself, right? There's something about tasting and seeing. I, I, I was sitting there writing the other night, and um, it's two out of our five, we're taste and see, two of our five senses, taste. Man, thank you, Jesus, for the ability to taste. Amen? Oh, that was one thing that I prayed against when COVID was going around and I had COVID, you know, almost, you know, a little over a year ago or under a year ago. And uh, I was like, God, please don't let my taste go away. Maybe it should have. It would have helped me out a little bit more. But <laughs> man, I'd be a very sad man, man, if I wasn't allowed to taste food. I mean, isn't it though, but you think about taste, isn't it so... So our taste buds, aren't they so acute and accurate and, and connected? I remember being in Tanzania, Africa, and picking up watermelon and eating it there. There was no pesticides and all the other stuff we had in America. Wow, the sweetness of that melon. Man, I, I'll go back to it. Even right now, come on, come on. Somebody just need to close your eyes for just a moment and think about this. How about the taste of some good old sweet corn? Come on. Isn't it just sad? I mean, across the room, it's just sad. If you missed it online, you're just, mm, people across the room, just, mm. But even but back home in Wisconsin, we had this place. It was out in Hadley, Wisconsin, and they had super sweet corn. Mm. Come on, somebody. It was like, it was like, we lift him up. We lift him higher, right? You know, not just sweet corn, but super sweet corn. Man, corn, I think one of my favorite things to eat, but it's one of my wife's least favorite things in watching me eat. <laughs> 22 years of marriage yesterday. I, I'm like a typewriter, and when I dive in, I don't come up until I'm to the end of the row, and you have to reset for the next row. Anybody else like that? Come on, come on. That's right. I noticed it was really the men across the room that were like that. Any other wives disgusted by your husband's corn eating? Yeah, thank you. I see those. Oh. How about the ability of our taste buds to pick up the different notes and flavors in coffee, like chocolate and fruit and different acidic levels? Some of you are like, I mean, Bob, you're like, there's different flavors of coffee. I thought it was strong, hard, and heavy all the way. Come on. If the spoon can stand up in it, that's what I want. Come on. But the taste and see that God is, the, the taste and see that the Lord is good. Where we dig into the, the goodness of God, that we grab a hold of him, and we see who he is, and we explore the depths of his goodness and the life. And as much as you explore the foods and the recipes today that you enjoy, what would happen if you, instead of scrolling Pinterest for the next recipe, that you actually pressed in a little bit to his word and said, God, you are good. Some of us, we just need to sit back sometimes like, man, he is good. We'll sit back and hear a, 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 maybe, I mean, sometimes just hearing a, a jazz music, a musician or a, a, somebody picking up an instrument and just going to town and you're like, wow, they're good. Have you ever stopped and just sat back and said, wow, look what God's done in our lives. I got up early yesterday morning and they said it was our anniversary, and I was like, I'm going to go find our, our wedding um, picture book. And we didn't really like all the pictures that were in the wedding and the quality I mean, back in the day, whatever. And so, uh, but I was, I went to, I found a tub. We have tubs, and they're all numbered and labeled. And I don't think I have access to the numbers of what they mean anymore. So I'm digging through tubs, and I find the tub of pictures, and I start pulling through and start looking at the, some things for, you know, not only for us, but then for our when each of our kids, when, you know, Kaylin, uh, you know, we're, I saw her baby picture the first time, you know, Stacy got to see her, uh, all of our kids just seeing all their little stories and all the things that were inside there and saying like, you know, and we're getting ready on the other end now to take her off to college and we're on the other end of this place. And you just see the goodness of God. How many times we just sat back and said what the enemy meant to steal, kill and destroy that God restored. 
Sometimes just understanding his goodness and the fruit of the spirit of goodness is just sitting back and saying, God, thank you. Taste and see that the Lord is good. The other one of those fruits of the, the, uh, the senses is the sea there. How many times have you looked in the evening sky and stood in amazement of the painting that Jesus had just painted across the sunsetting sky? I always go back to, I shared, I have a picture on our slides that it goes back to our house uh, when we were in, was, uh, up in Toledo and uh, we lived in the country. And while the painting of the sky wasn't, but just the whole, for me, we lived in the country and just to see the fields across the street where the corn was and how that grows and all the, just, just to see that. You can walk into our dining room and that was the image that we would see out of our, kitchen, our dining room window at night just to see me. Stand around here and you look into the sky and see the deep purples and the blues with the reds and the oranges. How truly thankful are we for the ability to be able to see with our eyes the wonder and the majesty of all who God is and all that he's doing. And I don't know if this was totally politically correct or whatever, but when I see someone who is blind, I think of the blessings at times that they don't have to see the destruction of what's going on around. But then I think of what about the, how, how would I describe to them the sunset of the beauty of what we see? And how sight was important to Jesus that he, he took and spit in the dirt, right? Put the dirt in the eyes and that the blind could see. Why? Because taste and see the goodness of our God. Can I encourage you this afternoon, when you go home, when you're out and about, to ponder that scripture, to think about God's goodness, and look at your life and see what is good about around you? How does Jesus see you truly? And not how the world sees you, but how does he see you? How do you see him? What's going on? And when we only, then when we get the opportunity to not only look at the character trait and the fruit of the Spirit of God of who He is, but also in the light of who we are and how we're supposed to respond. How are we supposed to walk out goodness? What is it that we embody? Goodness is a fruit that is best given away by the example of our lives. Let me say that again. Goodness is a fruit that is best given away by the example of our lives. We're going to look at a portion of scripture here in Ephesians 4 and 5 that speaks to our walking out what goodness means in our life. Ephesians 4, verse 25, and I'll finish up here in just a moment. It says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Verse 27, and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who is need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good and fortification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Verse 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you have sealed for the work, whom you were sealed for the work uh, for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Verse chapter 5, 1, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us in offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. We are to walk out in our life the goodness. We need to walk out goodness in our attitude. Just in verse 26, be angry and sin not, right? Don't give an opportunity for the devil and his opportunity. Verse number 30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. 5, 1, and 2, be imitators of God. We walk out the goodness of God in our attitude. Our attitudes are the reflection of the way we look at life. Don't, do you deal with anger issues? 
When someone does, something doesn't go your way, when you get frustrated, do you immediately pop off? Is your initial response, your normal response, anger? What would your family say about that anger? Would they say that anger is part of your response and defense mechanism in your life? Don't give the devil an opportunity, verse 3, to impact and infect your life. Goodness is a great correction action to dealing with anger in your life. Psalm 4.4, 4, I don't have it up there, but it says, don't sin by letting anger gain control over you. You want to deal with anger? If you have an anger problem, deal with the goodness issue. Well, I, I, I get angry at all these things. Well, let's talk about what is good. What, is, what do I like about this situation? Why, why, what's the reason I get angry? Is because I, I don't understand? Because it's not my way? Because it's whatever? Let's step back and let goodness of God, let the goodness of the fruit of the Spirit be functioning in our life. Verse 30 said, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Don't shut him down, but be willing to follow his lead. Don't deny him and what he is doing in your life and through your life. Goodness is is reflected um, not only in our attitude, but it's also reflected in our actions by revealing what our motives and our priorities are in this life. How do you live out goodness? It's about your your motives and your priorities. It's your actions. To walk out goodness in your life is, deals with your attitude, but it also deals with your actions. Verse 28, he said, he who steals must steal no longer. If you're stealing, stop, right? Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, and clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. If you got those things going on in your life, stop. Verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also is forgiving you. Start to do that. Start to be kind. Start, let the goodness of God impact your actions. The goodness of God is in your action is reflected in honest work and not stealing. It's expressed in a life that is controlled, not controlled by bitterness or other malicious behavior such as wrath and anger. Goodness is expressed in a life in which kindness, compassion, and forgiveness is the norm. It's reflected, goodness is reflected in your life through your attitude, through your actions, but it's also expressed in your speech. Verse 29, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only watch, only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment. So that it would give grace to those who hear. Well, how do you speak to your kids? How do you speak to your husband? You can watch the TV shows, right? How many times is the husband degraded on the television show? Right? And then that gets modeled at home. Why are your kids having problems respecting your husband? Or why do they have problems respecting your wife? What are you saying about them? Do you, what, are your, what are your kids, how do they respect their, I mean, let's say, how do they respect the office of the president? by the way you speak about him. Whether you agree with his policies or not, there's still a place that you say, well, how do I turn that? We're called to pray for our leaders. Right? We we turn in our vocal and our speech. Even Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, evil words come from an evil heart and defile the person who says them. Goodness is expressed in our speech. What is the words that come out of your mouth? What we say reveals a lot about who we are. I'll pull up behind somebody and they'll have a bunch of stickers on the back of their car, bumper stickers, and I'm like, wow, that speaks a whole lot about who you are. I don't even need to talk to them because sometimes your speech, listen, your speech is not only what you say with your mouth, but it's, it, it's what you post on your stickers on your car, but it's also on your social media it's on all these other things, right? Your, the, the speech and how do you respond? How do you talk? See, goodness exists when words of kindness, not words of, dispre- dis- words of disrespect and dishonor are expressed. The more that we lean into God, the more that the words that come from our mouths will reflect our relationship and his impact and goodness in us. You think, well, I have a hard time with speaking these, some of these things. And I say, well, what's your proximity to the Lord? Well, I, I, listen, you have time to read every other website and every other scroll Facebook, but why? Well, we don't have time to read the Word of God. 
I'm a guy that used to get up and I'd like to get up and read the, uh, watch the news and um, talking heads on television, you know, in the morning, drink a cup of coffee or whatever. And went to school, you know, I did school and then I started living my mornings at Panera Bread doing schoolwork. But now I've been, I get up in the morning and I, uh, I'm like, I don't think we turned the television on until the afternoon yesterday at some point. And, and th that's not even different than what we did on Friday and my day off on Friday. But I got up and I, I read, I don't know how many, I'm trying to catch up in my Bible reading right now from when I was finishing schoolwork. And I, and I just sat and I had my cup of coffee and I sat there and read the word of God. And then I picked up another book that I was reading for my own development, personal development, and read that instead of turning on the boob tube. Right? You, you have time, but what do you choose to invest in your time and what do you choose to put in? If you don't like what's coming out of your mouth, then I want to ask you, what are you putting in? Because that's what's within your heart. That's what's within your spirit. You don't like what you're coming out. Friends, this is a character, fruit of the spirit. If it's not wholesome, if it's not healthy, as the word of God says, if it's not development and, and, and building up one another, being kind to one another, if we're not imitating God, then friend, that's not in anybody else. That's on you. And you have a character flaw. You have a fruit of the spirit flaw. Your fruit is bad. And when Jesus dealt with bad fruit, he removed it. Because it, listen, now, we, we, we got people, there was somebody this week that was upset about whatever happened in the church and blah, blah, blah. And I was prepared. I dealt with him at one point. I dealt with him at another time. I was, and you're like, well, it's just stuff underneath the water, under, water under a bridge. And I said, no, it's not, because you're still talking. You're still communicating in a bad way. We at this church deal with our issues. You got an issue, we're going to talk about it. We're going to figure it out. I don't like talking about my feelings, but we'll talk about them. My wife knows I don't like talking about my feelings. But we'll deal with issues. We got stuff going on because we got to... A little bit of, of leaven in the, in the bread. I mean, a little bit of it can destroy and ruin the whole thing. I tried to make bread the other day and it must not have had enough temperature in the water or whatever because then the yeast didn't grow up and it didn't do what it's supposed to do. And so what I do, I threw the whole thing out in the trash. Said, I'm not going to waste the rest of my time dealing with that. Friends, we got to deal with the fruit. We got to deal with our character character is a representative of what's in your heart and what's in your life. So in goodness, it reflects our attitude, our actions, and our speech. So maybe asking, why does goodness matter? Goodness is an indication that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and control our lives. It's when our actions, our attitudes, and our speech give clear evidence that he is in control. The fruit of the Spirit of goodness and the other eight of them are then evidenced in our actions, our attitudes, and our speech. We see this in the book of John where Mary was walking out goodness in her life when she got down and she, she washed Jesus' feet with the perfume. She took her hair and washed it and, and that act of goodness was an act of great cost and humility on her side. She comes and pours out this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet and then wipes it off with her hair. And Judas, who was the disciple and man in charge of the money, gets up upset at such an expensive act that the perfume that she wasted could have been used for better purposes in his own eyes. The original text speaks of the value of that perfume being full of worth of a, a full day's work. Now think of your wages. If you make $250 a week, it would have been worth $50. If you made $500 a week, it would be $100. If you make $1,000 a week, it would be worth $200 in that bottle of perfume that she poured over Jesus' feet. Why do I share this story? Because goodness, like the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, requires sacrifices of our time, our agenda, our priorities, and our entire life. And the question that we have to satisfy in our heart is, are we willing to pay the price for that sacrifice? For the Spirit of goodness... The fruit of the spirit of goodness, along with all the fruits, we must be willing to sacrifice our lives to allow the Holy Spirit to work in us to the extent that he needs. Pastor Jim Cain says the fruits of the spirit are these are the fruits of the spirit that not the fruits of our best efforts, but the fruits of our and not the fruits of our good intentions. They are the fruit of the spirit, 
not the fruit of our best intentions and efforts, but they are his fruits. These are the results of us letting God truly guide our lives and affect every aspect of it. They are both evidences of and the results of our commitment to God. But then we begin to develop them as we surrender ourselves to God. Let me say to you today that if you are frustrated with your faith, maybe it's because we, you have tried so long in your own strength to live out what needs to be done and what you're supposed to be doing. And what you need to do is throw your hands up and surrender and let the power of God's spirit live inside of you and help you live for God. This surrender is for all of us. It's not that we initially give our, not just about initially giving our hearts to God when we surrender to Jesus, but it's the sacrifice and laying down our own life, our future, our vision, saying, God, I can't do this anymore. I've already made a mess on my side. I need you to take the wheel. But that's not the end of it. That's only the beginning because it continues as you surrender your being and willing to go back to Jesus again and again and again to lean into him and to surrender again and again. Because the truth is, sometimes we go along and we decide to pick things back up again. And we need to come to the place where we lay it down and we surrender to him. Friend, what is the goodness of God in your life? How do your actions, your attitude, and your speech line up for the word and the goodness of God? I I love that I wish there was a little magic button you can push and say that was easy, right? You know, like whatever that, was it uh, Office Max or Staples used to have that button? That was easy. But the truth is the fruit of the Spirit is a sacrifice. It's a walking out of, we'll be walking it out every day of our lives for the rest of our lives. To do it, we lean into Jesus a little bit more. That's where it starts. Lean into him a little bit more and say, God, would you evaluate my attitude? Would you evaluate my actions? And Lord, if my speech isn't lining up, will you help me to walk out the goodness of God in my life? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you today for your goodness and your mercy and your presence. God, I pray across this room that as we look at our lives, we evaluate our hearts and our lives, as we look to you, God, would you, number one, be lifted up within us. Father, I pray this morning that if there's any across this room that need to surrender to you today, that maybe today is the first time they begin, they surrender, and they, that we talk about the goodness of God, and, and they say, well, I, I'm a good person, but, but God, it's about taking that next step, about being surrendered to you Lord, I pray today that across this room that that's where they would start. And with the eyes closed and heads down, maybe that's you today. Maybe you need to start your relationship with Jesus and it begins by you surrendering your life to him. And just quickly across this room, if that's you and you've never done this before, I just want you to just slip your hand up real quick and I'd love to be able to pray with you and encourage you across the room this morning. Those of you that are watching online, if that's you, just reach out to us. Shoot me a message. Shoot the church a message, and we'll follow up with you. But across this room, and maybe today that's not where you're at, but maybe today where you're at is you're, you need just to re-surrender. You need to recommit because your life, some things are, are shifting and slipping in your life. And today, God has been speaking to you this morning about dealing with your actions, your attitude, and your speech. If that's you today, maybe I'd love to be able to just pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to come down, but if that's you today, and maybe the Lord's been speaking to you about your actions, your attitude, or your speech in regards to the goodness of God, would you just slip your hands? I just want to pray with you, for you, yeah. Who else across the room? Yep. Anybody else? Father, I thank you today for each one that raised their hands. I thank you, God, for today for those that... Lord, that we would have the ability to make a marked change. Lord, even from the simple response of raising a hand, may that trigger a motion in our lives. Lord, that the areas that you're pushing on in our spirit, that you would push those things to the surface that are unpleasing to you that we need to work on. God, so that we can lean in and be closer to you. 
And Father, for others, the others in this room that maybe didn't raise their hand this morning, God, across all of us, may we just recognize your goodness as we taste and see that you are good. Lord, I pray that you would remind us of the things that you've done, that we wouldn't lose heart, that even though some of our testimonies are older, but God, I pray we'd have a testimony for today. And maybe today's testimony, God, is that we came and our eyes were opened to your goodness and who you're doing and what you're doing today, that you continue to provide and meet all the needs as we trust you. God, I thank you for this body. Thank you for this church and this family. Lord, I pray your blessings upon them, whether in this room or whether they're at home, wherever they're watching. God, would you go with them? Would you be with them? And may your goodness and kindness and gentleness and faithfulness and all the fruits of the Spirit reign in their lives. And we ask this today in your precious name. And everyone said, amen. 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 Friends, be.